started. Um, this, we have pretty well covered everything that we have talked. We're down to uh, criminal justice. So, Ms. Noops, would you kind of like to read that? I'll be glad to. Thank you. Okay, um, probably the first thing that you might want to talk a little bit about is probation. So, you know, we started earlier last year with hiring probation. We started with hiring the director and then worked with her to hire her team. I would say probably from scratch, it's one of the best teams that anyone has ever put together. She's done a fantastic job there. We've had some growing pains in the processes obviously we put together a new department. Um, Stephanie's and the finance department has done a fantastic job because this is a new relationship between the county department and the Spirit Courts Office of Finance as far as how that flow goes. <clears throat> um, but they're doing really, really well. I think one of the things that was surprising to us is just the volume. You know, we started out with a um, average number of cases that each officer should have and we're, we're very close to getting down to that. Uh, what's taken a little longer is just the mess that we inherited from private probation. You all knew that was going to be a significant mess. It was a disaster. It was worse than what we, we thought. There were, um, their cases weren't even filed. They were just shoved in filing cabinets. Basically what we inherited was several thousand cases in filing cabinets and that was just it. So the judge has been working with, um, with probation to get those processed. A lot of them have had to be dismissed. So we've lost that fine money. Um, that's private. That was the private probation's problem, and that's what one of the reasons why we made the change. <clears throat> but probation cases have a time limit on them. That if they're not going to be addressed within that time limit, the cases have to be told or basically extended through the court. So if you don't meet that deadline, which a lot of them have already expired, then we, we lost those there. Um, <clears throat> revocations are a huge issue right now. I have never seen citizens so determined to fail in life as I have those that I see in revocation hearings. So basically, what a revocation hearing is, if you don't know, is once you've committed a crime and you go through the state court process and the judge says this is your sentence and this is going to include probation, then you meet with your probation officer. If you do not follow those rules as far as when you're supposed to report, or if you fail a drug test, or if you're not current on your fines and don't go to counseling and do all those things like you're supposed to, then the probation officers by law have to notify the judge and your probation is revoked. That's basically, you know, we put you on a plan, you didn't adhere to that, so if your probation was in lieu of jail time, so now you're going back to jail. So they see 50 to 60 people through revocation hearings, which is in addition to the new court processes where we're taking on average somewhere between 80 and 100 new people on probation every month. So whenever Judge Edwards says we have a very busy state court, we absolutely have a very busy state court. And we're seeing those numbers real time now on our side. So <clears throat> in addition to all the court time, the officers are only left with about one to two, day, to two days each week to do the rest of their work. And that's seeing their probationers. Um, and also following up on a fail to report list. So whenever probationer is supposed to come in to meet their probation officer and they don't, they have to follow up right away and there's a process and a procedure for that. So if you see any of the officers out coming through the lobby of our building and they're not stopping to talk because they're running out, it's just because they are absolutely they that busy. <clears throat> so by budget, um, yeah, by budget, Stephanie and Felicia will have um, a good report for you all on um, what our our supervision fee collections right now are looking like. Um, one thing, if you flip over to the next page to look at, and we mentioned this yesterday whenever we were talking <clears throat> to Robin about community service. Community service really is um, something that's given whenever people say, I can't afford that fine amount. I mean, the judges try to help them out. We certainly don't want to keep them in jail. That just costs money as well, and that's not where they need to be. Um, <clears throat> but right now, for six months, um, there was almost $23,000 that was converted to community service that would have been fine money. So again, whenever we're looking at balancing the revenue, we have to remember that that's an option and why. Um, 
right now six officers are working almost 2,300 cases. Um, they've taken on 825 new cases in that six month period, almost 700 revocation hearings, and they've closed 613 cases, and those are those closed cases are part of that process of cleaning up that private probation. Um, so does anyone have any questions or comments about where we are with probation? Well, everything I've heard, I know that their workload is just tremendous, again, trying to take over one program and then, and then the fact that also that it was a, a, a new program for the county as well. Everything that I've heard about it is that, it, as you said earlier, it's been tremendously successful. Now, I do have a concern is that as we move forward and we continue to have cases and they continue to have a larger workload. I mean, you get to a point that you can only manage so many. I think you said, what, 60? Is there a number out there to say um, right now that um, they're, they're attending 60 um, revocation hearings? But how many cases can a officer successfully manage? So we try to keep them in our goal, and this is kind of an industry standard is between 250 and 300 cases per officer. Obviously that 250 is more manager, manageable and that's more ideal. But keep in mind too that <clears throat> probation is, um, not every probationer requires the same amount of oversight. So some people are on there for a shorter period of time and they may only have to report once a month. Then you have other people who are gonna be on probation for a year and they have to report every week so it's um, whenever you hear that number of 250 or 300 people to manage you're not having to manage them all at the same level we're almost there um, one of the things that probation supports significantly that I don't think that we <coughs> understood to the extent that they do until we became involved is the DUI court you know, that's the accountability court that we have in state court so we have an officer that is assigned to that team and for Alicia also backs up that effort and there is additional um, drug testing that's required for those in DUI court and we have to take them in more often and, and help them through that process too so they really do have a lot going on those revocation hearings the judges because of courtroom space and time <clears throat> they run two courts right next to each other at the jail simultaneously and so the officers are working back and forth between those courts and of course no one wants to tell a judge hold on a minute we can't get in there you know we've got to so everyone state court and probation is working really well together to try to manage um, that but it is a challenge um, but I think that once we finish closing which we should probably within the next 30 days have the rest of those old cases closed out and just because <clears throat> Probation officer positions are really hard to hire locally. Um, you all did a great job at the, 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 with the pay scale as far as the pay grade that that's set at. But, you know, our, the people in our community that would have experience or that might want to work in probation, their only um, perception of that is the problems that they've seen with private probation. So people that you would think might want to get into that, law enforcement and things like that, that have that kind of experience, nobody wants to get anywhere near probation because it's always been a disaster. So I think that our applicant pool will continue to improve and change the longer people see that the county's probation department is a great department, it's a great place to work. Um, but we really do. We started with three of the five that we initially hired had zero probation experience. And there's a lot of legal that goes into what they do. They're actually writing warrants for the judge to sign. They're writing orders for him to approve and sign. Um, they have to go through back background checks and be approved through um, the state oversight authority for probation. We have an audit coming up related to that. It is very heavily regulated. So it takes a lot to start from scratch and I think that's one of the places where we really appreciate Felicia's talent is for her to be able to take someone who kind of knows but really doesn't know what they don't know at that point and have as successful as a department as we have now less than a year in. It's, it's amazing. Good. Good. We knew that this was going to be very difficult. And I think I told y'all uh, before, I had a probation office in the previous county. 
uh, not the size certainly we have here, but it was a continual headache as far as the requirements of the pages coming. And one of the most frustrating things about this is going to be an issue that you look at or you look to during the budget every year because we, we're going to have to spend more money in order to catch up and stay ahead. And as Paige said, there is a certain group of individuals in the, our society that is determined and hell-bent to fail rather than succeed. And that responsibility of trying to help them is expensive and it is manpower consuming. Well, and that's, that's the reason I asked about the workload, because I knew that once you got to a level uh, of, of workload for each probation officer, then it was going to take more probation officers to be able to do that work. And I'm sure there's going to be other things. I mean, you get an officer, then you're talking about a vehicle. I mean, you're talking about a lot of different... So they don't have vehicles. They don't do, they don't go out into the community and, and do home visits like felony probation does. Oh, okay. So everything is in the office. So we, we don't have that overhead. Um, in the budget, though, they have asked for um, one more administrative person. Um, part of the challenge in them working multiple courts at the same time is that once a probationer is assigned to a probation officer, that's their person. And if you have a situation where <clears throat> that probation officer is taking care of another probationer next door, their, their probationer comes up in another courtroom and you try to get another officer to handle that, it's really hard. It would be a little bit like having Mike send out Robin's crew in the morning. There might be a work order there in front, but he's not going to know from her perspective exactly what to tell them to go and do. So <clears throat> if we could, if there's funding available to add an additional administrative person, then that would put kind of a, a clerical support in that courtroom to help write up some of that stuff, which would <clears throat> help them tremendously with their paperwork and the flow of that. Um, and it would really help Felicia a lot, too, because right now she's having to be that seventh officer. If someone's out, we've had um, one of the officers had a um, family member that was sick for a while, and they had to be out, and another one um, had a baby, and so we had an attorney leave there. So she has to fill in as that officer whenever that happens. Where's this office? There in Leela Ellis. Mm -hmm. Right, right near. So... Um, and that, that seems to be working great as far as, you know, people getting in and out and knowing where it is and it being close to the courthouse and that type of thing. Yeah, so. Well, I didn't realize that. And so I, I assume then that if, if you have a, someone that's on probation through state court and, and they don't, they're not doing what they should be doing, they're not reporting, <clears throat> then rather than what, I traditionally think of probation officers. You go out and you try to find them, you right. locate them, you go to mama's house. Yeah, and that's mama's felony house. probation. Right, okay, yeah. so you don't do that. So then really what they do, if they don't show up, then they just go back to the judge and report, and basically that's when the revocation process they starts. They send a warrant over to the okay. judge and say, this is, and the judge says, yep, okay. you're right, they've not been doing what they're supposed to do, okay. I'm gonna sign this warrant. That goes into a basket that goes to the sheriff's office, and then they get the sheriff picks them off. Then they go to jail, and which is what right. we were trying to avoid all along. Exactly, and we, yeah. you know, we don't, we don't, it spins. we don't right. throw right. them away at that point. You know, I know that this is a little bit of a of a personal perspective and 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 all that, but you know, these are not all bad people. These are people who've made bad decisions, and so even once those warrants are issued, they <laughs> try to. <laughs> They just keep making bad decisions. Is that what I feel like I'm making a bad decision on this. <laughs> um, but they, they still try to, to reach out to these people. And I say that because I have been, just to, to help Felicia and understand, you know, the challenges that they were facing so that I can make a recommendation for Mr. Pritchard to look at what they needed, I have been and sat through revocation hearings. And I have been there when there's been people who have come before the judges that the judge has said, you know what, Mr. Slaughter, I really did not think that I would ever say this to you. In fact, I can't imagine that these words would ever come out of my mouth in this courtroom, but I've never seen anyone turn themselves around like you have. You've done everything well, that you. you're supposed to do. <laughs> <laughs> exactly, right? I mean, there, there are people that, that are making better decisions after
through the process. And right. so, okay. you know, yeah. that's that's really what we're here for. I, mean, I that's understand, what's and, and it is. I mean, I, 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 I agree that, that it is an opportunity for some folks really to get their life on track and understand that they're not making the right decisions. And, and there's a lot of good that does come out of it. But there still is, a, a there, as Mr. Pritchard said earlier, the frustration is is that you get someone <clears throat> into a program, you get them trying to give them all the help that you have the availability of to help them, but they just won't help themselves. No, I get it. And, and so that still happens, and that'll always be there. I mean, it's just not going to go away. And and so it, ultimately, at the end of the day, it ends up costing the, the, the rest of the citizens sure. in this community. It ends up costing them. And so... Um, I'm well, glad to see that we started this and, and that it's working very, very well. And, uh, you know, I can't see anything but success coming out of it. And so we just need to continue to work on it and, and make it as good as it can possibly be. Well, you know, being married to a career law enforcement officer and, and just because of the way I was raised, I was have always been very much you do the crime, you do the time. I mean, that's just the value system yeah. that I was raised with. And, of course, then with Joe's work, but your perspective changes just a little bit, especially after I went to the first revocation hearing and I came back and told Mr. Pritchard, and I think I told you too, what we need to do is find out how much money we need to write each one of these people a check for in exchange for them just following the law. Because we, it would be cheaper for the taxpayers of Lowndes County just to pay people who said, I think I'm going to go shoplift. Well, hold on, what, what, what you need us to write you? Because by the time they get in the system, even with the fines that we collect and even with all the programs, it is still a tremendous cost to the taxpayers. Oh, yeah. I so, mean, and it always, criminal justice has always been, a, I mean, you can't look at it <clears throat> from any other way than, than you're not going to get, it never will pay for itself because it's always going to cost citizens, um, and it's going to cost them a lot, mm -hmm. uh, you know, just, just from criminal justice and all the way in, you know, taking the whole aspect of the, of, of the additional need for public safety right. personnel uh, because you have those people in the society. Yeah, and uh, as we grow, it gets bigger. Mm -hmm. yeah. right. You know, I'd like to also say, you know, I, and, and I believe in, and I, I got hope in anybody, and hope in any criminal justice system possible form, but it, it's always been my perspective that we possibly need to look at addressing it from the front end. Uh, that's why I'm a, I'm a component of things like I'm saying, let's talk about the, the community centers. Uh, start while they're young, uh, uh, before they get into the system, before they get the habits, or give them something to do. Because the idle mind is the devil workshop. And, and long story short, I think back years ago when I was growing up, I mean, we didn't have it the best, but <laughs> we had to to occupy our minds. And, and what I'm saying is, you know, I just think, you know, we could look at from a commission standpoint of trying to address some of the stuff on the front end, and, and that's what I think I like to see us do. Well, what what you what you had, and I don't get off into that debate, but what you had is what a lot of these individuals don't have, and that you had that stability in the home life, and you had discipline in your home that you that you were at, whether it be your parents or your grandparents. These kids anymore, a lot of them. Uh, at very young ages, they no longer have that home connection, and so their life becomes the street. It becomes their their peers who are no different than they are, and so that you know, they get involved with these games, they get involved with um, starting out with you know misdemeanor, mischief type stuff, and it just keeps growing and growing and growing. And next next thing you know, you what they have created for themselves is uh, is basically a, a professional criminal life. I mean, that's the only thing they know. They don't know anything else. And I was just thinking about that team scene that we had talked about at one time. You know, I'm just, just just putting things out there. When I think about the amount of money that we're starting to start getting into, um, you know, when you look over the period of years, we might can invest in one of those, and maybe it might, you know. Well, we got a lot of things out there. The Balance Land Parks and Recreation Authority do it. They do a tremendous job. I mean, a lot of those kids have the opportunities to be involved in, in youth sports. And like you said, you know, these kids need to have something to do. Uh, they need good guys. And I'm not saying that everything should be sports related, but I've always looked at it from a standpoint, again, if they're involved in something and they have that kind of becomes their family, becomes their interest, that takes place a lot of times of that lack of family unity, if, you know, 
by just being a part of a team. And certainly, you know, it's, uh, there's there's opportunity. The Boys and Girls Club over on Tomb Street, they do a tremendous job with that after school program. And so the more of those things that, that the community is willing to step up and do, the more impact that it's going to have on those type of issues. I mean, I was amazed. I'm not here advocating the Boys and Girls Club, but those kids that do the after school well, that, program at the great. Boys and yeah. Girls Club, uh, the last number I heard, they got a 100% graduation rate for those kids that go through that program. It, it, that, that, I guess that's why I'm bringing it up. Because <coughs> one, that team center they do have, it is great. I wish everybody could participate in, but of course it's limited. It <laughs> you is, know, there's only limited, so many slots, yeah. and then you got the criteria being, you know, of course, in, in the city school system, yeah, uh, and so forth. You know, and that's the, a part of the criteria. But uh, yeah. I just, I just see the positives from that, yeah. and I really wish we had something similar uh, that they could take advantage of in the in the county yeah. uh, area on a couple of years. Well, I think maybe the. Boys and Girls Club, and, and I don't want to get into their business, but I, I, I think that they've realized that that really is where they're having an impact on the young people in this community now, and they're focusing on that teen center, that that youth program over there, and um, I, you know, I wish them the best in the world with that, because I've seen the positive things that come out of those type of relationships. Those kids, they, leave, they don't... They get on a school bus from school, and that's where they that's go at the end of the yeah. day. Mm -hmm. And they have to do their homework. I'm sure, there's right. time to shoot a ball and play mm -hmm. ball, mm -hmm. but there's also a time that they're required to sit in a classroom with an instructor there to help them with their homework, and they get their homework done. And so it's creating a, a very good opportunity for those folks. So right along the lines you said, I mean, th those things work uh, if, if they're positive in the community. But again, they're very, very expensive. You know, there's no way that they could do it without you know the funding that they're able to get through a, a grant program. So hopefully they'll be able to continue with that and continue to provide that service in this community. So, but there's opportunities for others as well. I, w I would like to, Mr. Chairman, if it's okay, set set the next topic up for Commissioner Evans to talk a little bit about as okay. far as the CASA program goes. Okay. That's okay with you. Um, okay. <clears throat> we are one.